Hello, everybody. I have no idea what Fedoris actually said, and so I assume it must be correct. Um, um, I think I heard Alexander Fleming. I've been uh, uh, at the Fleming for two and a half years now. I came from MIT, and I just want to say these have been the best two and a half years of my scientific life. The Fleming is an absolutely world-class institution, and it's been a real privilege to work there. Now, what I'm going to be talking about today is a, an idea about the future of science, which I and a few colleagues of mine came up with a couple of years ago. But it started really with the realization, um, this is a wonderful photograph of a great painter called Hans Hartung, the realization that um, um, there was um, something missing in science. Now, look at Hartung, and this is one of his paintings. And he painted that when I think he was about 82. And one day at an exhibition, some guy comes up to him and says, my six-year-old son could do this. And Hans Hartung, quick as a flash, replied, yes. But what's amazing is I'm 80 and I'm still doing it, you see? <laughs> and this is the kind of thinking that got us started on what would, be, what would it be like to be like Hartung, but as a scientist? In other words, how do you stay young as a scientist? Now, this is what I want to talk about in this lecture. Now, um, when I was a kid, I was brought up in France. So all these books will, be, will have French titles. And the science lessons uh, in, in French school were called leçons de choses, which means lessons of things. I can think of no better description of science than lessons of things. Now, you could have leçons de choses, you could have belles leçons de choses. And then, if you happen to be living in, in French West Africa, you would have leçons de choses tropicales, which, uh, unfortunately, I never got. Now, um, we used to have posters in the classroom, and this is a good example of one, where you have the egg, okay? And you explain the egg every possible way. So, for example, the eggshell, material science, why the egg cooks is protein denaturation, chemistry of carbonates. You can cook an egg, you're six years old, you can try and cook an egg, zoology, embryology, nutrition. And you see, what we were being taught was science as all of one piece. Basically, ab ovo, so to speak, the science was one science. Then what happens is you start going to you know, high school, but in the meantime, if you're a curious child, you read lots of things. Now, this is a random selection of the places where I found information, okay? Um, just by picking up books and so on and so forth, and really building up a general uh, uh, knowledge about uh, everything that excited and made me curious. And basically what happens after a few years of this is you become... Um, <laughs> which is terrible. My parents used to complain, you know, oh, God, you know. By the way, this wonderful Greek word means know-all, but in English, I think it's known as a know-it-all, okay? So, this state of being a xeroles is, um, is actually extremely desirable, but it's very hard to maintain. And one of the things that happens is you go to high school and college and so on, and all of a sudden you start being shunted into biology on the one hand and physics on the other hand. Now, notice the difference between biology and physics. Biology, really beautiful. I mean, very attractive looking insect, full of color. I mean, who wouldn't want to do that? Now, physics, an X-ray of a low energy bulb. This is kind of off-putting for many people, so they try and make it more exciting, but it still looks like hard work, you know? <laughs> so, by this time, people are already choosing whether they want hard work or pretty um, insects. And, um, and um, so what happens is a divide that is created, and which, per which continues through, uh, through one's studies and professional life, and it gets worse, as a matter of fact, because 10 years later, when you get a little more specialized, you're reading really, uh, you know, interesting, actually, this is very interesting stuff, but um, <laughs> seriously, um, uh, <laughs> you're reading books like this, or perhaps even more interesting, books like this, <laughs> and uh, by that time, these two people never meet, and if they met, they would have very little to talk to each other about. Now, this is a major problem. So, um, 
what happens eventually, really, is this. That, uh, as Mahatma Gandhi correctly put it, you end up knowing everything about nothing. And this is a major problem. Now, it wasn't always like this. And in particular, it wasn't like this at the beginning of Europe's organized intellectual life in the Middle Ages. So this is a temperature um, chart um, of the Middle Ages. I'm sure you've heard of the medieval warming period, medieval warm period, sorry, which lasted about 250 years. That's when people got out of doors and started walking around. And that's uh, when all the great universities of Europe were founded. Um, and uh, as you probably heard, there's a bit of warming now, so I think there's hope for uh, another intellectual revolution. Um, so all these universities were founded in that brief period, and everything stopped with the Black Death in uh, 1348. So um, what was happening then was really quite extraordinary, and some characters, some people emerged out of this that still um, stand as towering intellects uh, centuries later. One was Albertus Magnus, Albert the Great. He was German, he worked in Paris. And the other one was Roger Bacon, um, an English philosopher who worked in, in Oxford. Now these two people have one, and only these two people, have one extraordinary thing in common. They were both awarded a title which has never been given to anyone else in history, and it is the letters D-U, as they said, Dr. Universalis. Now, why were they Dr. Universalis? Well, quite simply, they knew everything. <laughs> they were the real, genuine Xeroles, okay? <laughs> and they were supposed to be able to teach everything. Now, we don't make them anymore, but when did we stop making them? Well, there's some argument about that. But generally speaking, people would agree that the last man to know everything was Thomas Young, and uh, if you read Thomas Young's biography, it's kind of humiliating. By, by page 10, he's already done more than any scientist that I have come across did in his whole life. So he was a doctor, he was a physicist, he's the guy who proved that light was made of waves. In his spare time, he deciphered Egyptian hieroglyphs at the same time as Champollion in, in France. And and he didn't want to tell anybody about all this stuff because he thought that it would, the patients would no longer come and be treated by him if they knew he was busy with, with hieroglyphs. So he published under pseudonym um, all these great things. Now, if we jump forward a century or so, this is Enrico Fermi, the great uh, Italian physicist, who is widely held to be the last man to know all of physics. And if you look at the books he wrote, it's plausible. Um, now, notice that the photograph on his desk, I don't know if you can see, it says secret on the, on, the actual, on the picture he has on his desk, which tells you that scientists are a terrible security risk. He has a picture of himself with a secret photograph on it. So, now if you look at the frequency of occurrence of uh, the words natural philosophy, specialist, and interdisciplinary as a function of time, this is from Google and Grimes, you find that Natural philosophy, which is, of course, what science used to be called, has decreased exponentially through time. People no longer describe themselves as natural philosophers. Um, the word specialist started at the turn of the 20th century and grew linearly ever since. And with about a 90-year lag, the word interdisciplinary is following the same, the same trajectory, which means that the more specialists you create, the more desperate you get to have interdisciplinary people to compensate for their specialized ignorance. So what we really want, if we go back to this dreadful existential choice between termites on the one hand and muons on the other hand, um, what we really want is to break down the barriers between ter termites and muons. Now, this may not seem easy, but in fact, it has been done. And in particular, it was done by a remarkable man that nobody much seems to talk about, Pasquale Jordan, a German scientist who was the co-author of the second ever paper on quantum mechanics. If you see on the right, there's one citation at the bottom of that page, and that's it. There's no more citations, and that's Heisenberg's first paper on quantum mechanics. What a wonderful situation to be in. He was 23 years old. Now, 
What he published in 1943, this is during the war, at the height of the war in Germany, he published a book called Physics and the Secret of Organic Life, which I bought secondhand. And on page 68, it has a chapter entitled Quantum Biology. Now, this is totally insane. Why should biology be quantum, right? Uh, this is muons and termites living together. And in fact, the book had inside it the receipt from the person who ordered it in Berlin in 43. Um, neatly typed receipt for, uh, let's see, um, eight uh, Reichsmarks. Amazing that they would still be printing books under the bombs. Um, anyway, I can prove that I'm a quantum biologist because that's what it says on my door. Um, and uh, that makes me, I suppose, a <laughs> xero <laughs> <laughs> But I am in an extremely good company of other Xerolakia, <laughs> namely these very fine people, most of them physicists, who um, have contributed to putting together this Dr. Universalis idea. So um, let me explain to you what we have in mind. So the physicist species he has a big head, uh, quite aggressive, if you've ever given a talk in the presence of physicists, particularly um, uh, theoretical physicists, you'll find that they're terrifying. They're like, um, they're like warrior termites. The biologist, by contrast, is a kind of harmless creature um, and really quite attractive in, in many ways. And what we're trying to do is to create a very large, um, powerfully built, but not particularly aggressive species called the Dr. Inerius Silas. Now, this will take commitment, time, and money. Let me talk about the commitment we have already, but let me talk about the time, timeline. So the, the difficulty, well, people will say, my God, you know, aren't we, um, aren't we spending enough time at college already? Do you really want to make, you know, you want to spend extra years making xerolas? Is that a good idea? And uh, you think about it. In uh, the Middle Ages, when there was very little to know, people spent five or six years at college. 700 years later, knowledge has increased a billionfold, and we still spend five or six years at college. There's something wrong there. Now, you will say, well, you can only go to so many parties and get drunk so many times. <laughs> so, th you know, this, that's the reason why the studies are the same length. Your liver gives out after a while. So, but what we're planning to do, of course, is to have actually a different structure. So, at, we start at 18, like everyone else, high school diploma, have a normal four-year degree, preferably in the physical sciences, because the math, if you're going to use mathematics, you have to have learned it somewhere fairly early. And then, an eight-year double doctorate, okay? Now, the doctorate, the length of doctorates varies quite a bit. In, in Europe, it tends to be three or four years. In uh, the US, it, it averages around six. So eight years should just about cover it. And one assumes, although it's not decided, of course, whether that, that, that people will have to write two theses, one in the biological sciences, one in, one in the physical sciences, or one which combines both. Now, after that, the people will come out fantastic. they will be like a four-wheel drive. They'll be the SUV of the intellect they will be able to go anywhere. And indeed, uh, they will probably go lots of interesting places. Now, how much is it going to cost? This is the question that, when, you, when, I, when I talk about this to professional policymakers in science, they start seeing Euro signs, you know? And the answer is, it's going to cost a lot of money. Now, very simple calculation. Suppose we have 12 of these dudes manufactured, that's 12, as in the 12 apostles, let's say. It's a random uh, 40,000 euros per year. This is not pay. This is pay plus expenses in the lab times eight years. That's 3.84 million euros. If anybody here has brought a checkbook, <laughs> please come and see me after the lecture. Um, um, and... Um, <laughs> And that's it, actually. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>